Good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. I'm very excited to talk about this project. A little nervous, too, because it feels like one of the most ambitious things I've taken on, and I'm not entire, entirely sure that I'm fit for the job, but I've done the best I could. So I just want to tell you a little bit of background on how this project came to be, and then Antoine and I are just going to talk about the joyful process of going through the, the whole um, poem and working together to translate it into English. Um, so we've got some stories to share and favorites to share with you. But so first, let me start by saying, I think most of you know, I have long loved Victor Hugo. I teach 93 as the final book of my Van Damme Academy students' education. I teach Les Miserables an abridged version, always in, to the seventh graders. Um, and I just think of Hugo as having had one of the greatest impacts on me personally of any author I've encountered. Um, I love the Chesterton quote that he calls him a man who finds meaning in everything. And I think of Victor, reading Victor Hugo as training to find meaning in things. And also just his Hum humanitarian and romantic way of looking at the world is one that's had a big impact on me. Um, I also have always or have long loved the plays of Edmund Rostand. I teach Cyrano de Bergerac every year to the eighth graders and the romantics every year to the seventh graders. And um, there's something about the Rostand spirit that just speaks directly to my soul. So one summer, I was in the Cotswolds reading this beautiful book that I've told you all about, The Man Who Was Cyrano by Sue Lloyd. And in it, she mentioned that Ross Stand had written a poem that was a tribute to Victor Hugo on the centenary of his birth called Un Soir à Ernani, An Evening in Ernani. Well, the, the meeting of these two worlds was very exciting for me. And I um, immediately went to my computer to look up, to find a translation of the poem so I could read it. And I found the poem, but I found that it had never been translated. And despite having taken many years of French, I am not fluent, <laughs> could not read it in the original. So that was very frustrating to me. What I did find in my search there in my Cotswolds cottage was a link to a first edition signed French version of the book um, inscribed here by Edmund Rostand with this beautiful classic uh, French paint splatter um, cover. And so I bought that for myself as a starting point. Um, so the first thing I did was recruit a friend of mine, a parent at my school who's uh, fluent in French, a native Frenchman, and um, meet with him day, or a couple days a week mornings to sit with the poem and translate it line by line. Of course, it's funny to think about it now because today I could just feed the whole thing into chat GPT and get a pretty reasonable, you know, blunt translation of it. But um, Google Translate was not sufficient for that job. So we would meet daily and go through it. But uh, the amusing thing about that process was that the person I recruited to help me with this was allergic to literature. I mean, really hated, <laughs> hated, hated reading in school, um, had no, felt no connection to the thing <laughs> we were translating at all. And at one point we encountered the word Ver, v e r s, and he translated it as worms, um, which is a, a true translation, but it also means verses as in poetry. <laughs> so it was the latter that Rostand intended here. So um, it was a fun process to sit with him and slowly, line by line, uncover the significance and meaning of each. By the way, this is a 25 page poem, so this is no small task. Um, but uh, that really what I came away with after that process was a very literal translation and a good sense of the spirit of the poem. So um, I think most of you know, I gave a lecture 
two years ago called, or a year and a half ago called um, Hugo, Hugo Rostand Ernani and How to Be a Romantic, and um, quoted extensively from the poem. But after that, I decided it really needs to exist as at least a passable translation in English. So I want to take on this project myself. And I had met Antoine in England once, and then he was at that conference, and he volunteered to be my partner in translation. So we would meet regularly on Zoom and um, and go through it together, discuss. He would help me not just to translate it, but to uncover the nuances of the translation and make sure that I had as close to an understanding of the original as I was capable of achieving. And then, so we would discuss the translations and I would go away and try to put it into passably beautiful English. Um, now, I did not take on the task of trying to translate it in verse. It is in verse in the original. Um, that was definitely too much for my talents, um, but I just wanted to make it, at least to my ear, sound pretty um, and and yes. capture the, the true spirit of it. Um, so that's what we have done. Um, I've already kind of made a disclaimer about myself having no pretensions of being a poet. I'm not, um, but I, I just hope I've done some sort of justice to it. Um, let's see. Okay, did I just see? Happy birthday, Luke. <laughs> not the centenary of your birth, but no, okay. Um, so I think what I'll do, I wish I had Antoine here, but he'll be here soon. Um, what I'll do is just start by summarizing the poem for you. I'm going to take it section by section. It, it's broken into seven sections. And I'll tell you a little bit about each one, and then Antoine's going to join me to describe um, some of the fun and challenges of each of these sections. So the first, in the first section, it's these long lyrical lines. Um, I'm going to just read to you the opening stanza, and then I'll describe what's happening in it. Ugh, I can't even pronounce the first line. Um, it's in the first line is in Basque, not even in French. And it's not easy to find a, a fluent Basque speaker. I'm going to guess we don't have any here today. Um, so the first line is in Basque and it translates as what is that village? So it, it says, um, hold on one second. Um, The old man stopped. The hour shone pink on the basalt cliffs. The mountain ran down to the glimmering gulf to mix its sheep with the fleecy waves of the sea. The ferns were dead and the grasses trembled. And black against the sky, at the bend in the road, where despite the season, the spiny broom guarded its yellow velvet between blue thorns. The man, enveloped by this vast rotunda, sat with the air of the greatest sadness on the back of a small mule-faced horse. And then again in Basque, he asks, what is that village? Okay, so the scene at the start is he's on a cliff overlooking a village. There's this old peasant on a, on a uh, mule-faced horse there with him. And he points to the village and says, what is that village? But, um, and so then afterwards it's, a series of rhapsodies on the word Ernani, because he says, I knew in advance what he was going to say. I already knew what that village was. I just wanted to hear this man in his sonorous Basque accent say the word Ernani. And it's so raw stand just to be able to revel in the very word of it, want to hear it pronounced and kind of reflect on and contemplate the significance of the word. So um, he has a lengthy passage just of 
how each vowel or consonant sounds from the mouth of this old Basque peasant. Um, and that's thrill enough for him. And then how the, the word itself reverberates in his soul more than reverberates with more echoes than you would hear if you cried out something into this valley. Um, and then he compares himself to this simple peasant who cannot possibly understand the significance of this word. Um, he says, pretty verses don't make crops grow. So the, he, he can't possibly understand its value. Um, and then another passage about how, well, maybe if it had been, maybe if a battle, this had been a battlefield and, and uh, something, there had been some battle of historic significance here. And as the peasant was tilling the field, his boot struck against the helmet of some old soldier. Well, then it might have significance. But um, the fact of this being a city that inspired Hugo's great play, Ernani, this is lost on the inhabitants of the town. So he is comparing himself to the peasant and then just reveling in the beauty and significance of the word Ernani. Now, those who didn't see my lecture, just briefly to reestablish that context, um, Victor Hugo was a crusader for the Romantic movement and an, an antagonist of the classicists. And he wrote in his preface to Cromwell all about the principles of Romanticism and what was wrong with the classicist uh, kind of dogmas. Um, especially the three unities of time and place and look and um, the time, the unities of time and place. So uh, when Ernani, his play was staged, this was meant to directly challenge all the classical dogmas and present the romantic vision on, st on stage. And it became an, an absolute battle in the theater. Um, between the classicists and the romantics and has stood since then as just this symbol of the fight for romanticism. So when uh, after Hugo, that at the, on the centenary of Hugo's birth, Rostand, who was a romantic and a lover of Hugo and carrying on the torch for romanticism, was asked by the editor of a French newspaper if he would write something in tribute to the occasion. And he suggested since Rostan lived in the Basque country and in close, uh, in the vicinity of Ernani, he suggested he go there as a little pilgrimage and then write a poem about the experience. So that's the context of this poem is he's going there, he's going to Ernani, the Spanish city that, in, that lent its name to uh, Hugo's play that had such significance for the Romantic movement and write a tribute to, um, to Hugo and to the significance of this event. So when he's looking at the village of Ernani, this is the meaning it has for him. This is the city that as a boy, when he was traveling through Spain, um, going to see his father, who was a general in the Napoleonic Wars, um, this is the city that would settle that whose name would settle in his soul like a seed that would eventually grow into the play Ernani. Um, so I think now when I asked Antoine, I said, okay, so just go through this and make a list in each section of your favorite passages. And he wrote back to me and said, I've tried, it's impossible. <laughs> and I said, okay, well, then in that case, just close your eyes and point in each section. And he said, I'll be sure to print the poem very small so that I can point at several things at the same time. So we'll have to wait for him. He'll be here soon to see what um, his favorites were. But I think there, there are too many for me to choose from, but I think um, I want to share the, the part about I mentioned about whether what it would have been like if if instead this had been the scene of a battle. So he says, um, I shudder. Oh, to think how this rustic says his name, not knowing it is illustrious. He cannot see that victory lives in this name. 
do pretty verses make the grass grow? No. And the plow, as it opens the land it clears, cannot make spring forth fragments of a poem. It is only the name of a triumph of art embroidered on the invisible banner and nothing for this coarse passerby makes it sacred. Ah, had it been the name of some massacre? Had the boot of this Basque as he tilled the field struck a skull in its loose fitting helmet, making it ring like some oversized sinister bell? Then he might whisper this name with odd respect. Um, for we worship a field where the god of war once reaped his harvest to the sound of fifes and where two kings enlaced the numbers traced on that ground in the bones of horses and men and Vagram knows it is Vagram, and Roncevo knows it is Roncevo. Can knows it is Can, but having let its battlements fill with flowers and fallen asleep on the road in the sun Ernani did not know it was Ernani. So that's this, it's so amazing. Now, uh, one of the treasures that I now possess is um, Antoine reading the entire poem in French. So that's something I'm going to make available too is this, this translation in English, but him reading the original in French. And it is absolutely exquisitely beautiful. And he is quite, uh, amazing as, as a reciter of poetry, an unknown talent. Um, so uh, I look forward to sharing that with you. Any questions before I'm having to talk? Yeah, Raj. Uh, thank you so much for uh, doing this. Uh, mm -hmm. I was wondering like with regard to your, um, what you just said about Antoine reading the poem, like would it be possible to have the English coming um, across as subtitles? Uh, I uh -huh. assume that it it would not be technically difficult to do. That's uh, interesting. Um, yeah. I'll think about, I'll, that would be nice to be able to read the translation as you're listening to it. Yeah. Okay, that's not something I've done yet. What I have done, I'll just skip ahead to this. So I've started, I mentioned this in my email, but I've started by just making a bunch of hand-bound books. Oh, there's Antoine, wonderful. Um, so uh, I had a long discussion with my daughter about how I said, it just has to be beautiful. There's a, the opening of the romantics. Um, there's direct, uh, instructions from the director. And it says, it can take place anywhere as long as the costumes are pretty. Um, that's, you can't do something Rostand and not have it be pretty. So again, I've done the best I could to make it as pretty pretty as I could. And I had my daughter, Lana, design the layout of it. And she has a very good aesthetic eye, in my opinion. So this is the cover, which I sent out to you. And then inspired by the Seamus Haney Beowulf that some of you read with me and the layout of it, which I just found so aesthetically appealing and so um, convenient for looking side to side at the original language. It's, it's laid out with the French on the left and then the English on the right so that you can see them directly next to each other. So at the very least, Raj, you could use the book for that purpose and probably be able to follow pretty well. Um, and then what I've done is hand bind the books myself. So this is my first endeavor into hand binding books. I had, um, uh, I learned the Coptic book stitch, which apparently was starting with one of the most difficult ones. Um, but what the wonderful, I find it very aesthetically appealing, but the other thing it does is let you lay the book flat, which you can't do with an Amazon printed um, paperback. So it's very nice when you're, especially if you're trying to look at the French and English side by side to have it lay completely flat like that. Um, so I've made 50 of these, um, I will confess because it was a labor of love that they take about 45 minutes each <laughs> and, um, and the, uh, the, um, supplies signed? are expensive. So signed, I hope signed, signed, yes, 50, 50 signed ones. Absolutely. Um, and they will be a little bit expensive. The Amazon 
printed copy will certainly be cheaper because the materials co cost quite a bit too. Um, I tried to get high quality paper and um, Antoine. Hello. Oh, sorry, sorry. I'm I'm late. Hopefully the sound is okay. This is a very uh, DIY setup. My new flat Wi-Fi is non non-existent. Basically, they've just cut the entire line. So. Oh dear. <laughs> Okay, well, we can hear you. I can hear you well, so I think we're good. Okay. So what I've done is give some background on the poem itself, on my first endeavors at translation, and then what you and I decided to do. And then I just went through the first section of the poem. Um, so uh, did you, would you like to share? I also told them that you said you, it was not possible for you to choose favorites um, and that you were going to print it very small and point at multiple favorites at once. But in any case, did you manage to pick a favorite from the first section? Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> I, think I did my, my best to, well, I, I got a few. Um, but yeah, Basque pronunciation, which we won't sure of. Because um, there's just, just about many people who speak Basque in the first place. Um, and it's not even something that it's the same Basque as it was um, out of nowhere. A, a Bulgarian colleague just speaks some Basque. So she helped me out. And apparently, yeah, and that's what we went for, which is just a literal literal reading of it, which is apparently how it's pronounced. Um, so you want to yeah, say it I um, I, I, It isn't in the recording for sure. Um, I think the, the first line is... Um, Zoin da I think. Yes. And yeah. yeah, it's just pronounced as we're just hard R's. That's, that's kind of the important thing. And it's kind of the, the second part of uh, what we liked in the first section was the focus on the Basque pronunciation from uh, Rostand and from the, the words as pronounced by the Basque peasant uh, mm. he meets. And there's a few stanzas. Um, dedicated to how every single letter of Ernani sounds and mm -hmm. a good uh, insistence on the on the A and then the, the deep, like quite good for R. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that was really what I, I loved most was kind of that, that particular part of part one. Now, do you have the poem in front of you? Um, I don't. I have um, a bunch of notes. Um, okay. Um, let me see because I'd really like you to read. I read the opening in English, but I would really like you to read the opening in French. Um, so what's... I, will, I, I can open it up. I can share... Uh, let's see. Um, what should, we consider, what should we consider to be the opening? Um, just the first few. Yes. Uh, well, I... Versus... Oh, dear. I posted a link to the uh, text in uh, on the web, if that's easier. Okay. And Antoine, I'm, we are having connectivity issues, so I'm wondering, um, as much as I'd like to see you, whether it would help to turn video off. I don't know if that makes... That that might help, yeah. Um, it, the, the four G connection might not be ideal. I have the text in front of me now. Um, if you can hear me okay, I can keep the camera. Otherwise, I can just get rid of it. Let's try without the camera or to see if it improves anything. It did um, seem to improve. Okay, then. Okay, and so can you just read um, the the first stanza through the. Mule-faced horse. Yeah, mule-faced horse, which we also had trouble uh, with. <laughs> yes. There was one very interesting verse to to go through. Um, okay. Zoin da eriori, le vieil homme fit halte. L'heure rosait au loin les croupes de basalte. La montagne semblait courir au golfe clair pour mêler ses moutons aux moutons de la mer. La fougère était morte et l'herbe tremblait toute. Et noir contre le ciel au tournant de la route, où malgré la saison, deux jeunesses épineux gardaient du velours jaune entre leurs piquants en bleus. L'homme, qu'enveloppait une vaste rotonde, était assis de l'air le plus triste du monde, 
sur un petit cheval à tête de mulet. So I did want you to hear what's lost when you lose the rhyme because it is it just just makes it so beautiful. Okay, so Antoine, we're on to section two. Um, this okay. was a really interesting challenge because the meter changes to these shorter, punchier lines of eight syllables each and this A, B, A, B uh, rhyme scheme. Um, Antoine, would you just read one stanza from that section to hear the difference? Um, sure. Um, let's... Yeah, okay. Uh, I mean, maybe, maybe a set of stanzas uh, okay. would be the best. Sounds um, good. Uh, let's do the first three. Okay. J'avais dit, puisqu'il existe entre les rues des Tolosa, un village fier et triste où la gloire se posa, puisqu'en descendant vers l'Ebre, on entend, près d'un roc nu, palpiter un nom célèbre sur un village inconnu. Puisqu'étant le nom d'un drame et le nom d'un drame en vert, ce nom là me touche l'âne comme des lauriers verts. Okay, so it's this very swinging, almost sing-songy back and forth. Um, so uh, I tried to keep the feel that you of, of those lines, but without the rhyme because that was too constraining for me. And the theme of this section is that since since Rustand will not be in Paris to celebrate the centenary of Hugo's birth, he has to find a way to worship here in Ernani. And he even, so he reflects and rhapsodizes on this, and he even seems to think that having his own private, humble little ceremony in this place of such significance will be better than being there for the public apotheosis, apotheosis that's happening in Paris. Um, so I loved just that concept, too, of how he's going to have this sacred, sentimental little celebration himself alone in Ernani. Um, the greatest challenge was keeping up that cadence. I'll just read my translation of those first lines that he did so you can hear it. I had said, since there exists between Iron and Tolosa, a village proud and somber where glory came to rest, since going down to the Ebro, we hear near a naked rock vibrations of a famous name on a village over a village unknown since as the name of a drama and the name of a drama in verse the sound of this name touches my soul as if with laurels fresh um and so so and but this since 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 he's building up to this idea that um uh it goes on for many lines where building up to what he will do since he cannot be in Paris. Um, it, it's honestly for two more pages that goes on. He says that, you know, since I, I'll have to drink from the hollow of my hand from the fountain, since I can't go drink from the hollow of my hand from the fountains of glory that will flow for you in Paris. Um, instead, I will plunge into the mystery of road and field and bush and honor the centenary in my own modest way. Um, and then he rhapsodizes on what it'll be like to um, have this celebration himself alone in Ernani. Um, anything, Antoine, did you have something you wanted to share? And then I do have a favorite line there. Um, share in terms of favorite lines in general? Favorite lines or just thoughts about that section? No, I, I think it's, first of all, it's the only section that's in this um, versification type. Um, so it really stands out. Um, and well, now we're looking at some other works of Ostana and we have more of those variations, but this is meant to be one whole poem and you have um, just this bit in it. In it and I really like the, the change in rhythm and the, the, it really fits well with his listing of all the things he can or cannot do. Um, so I, I really, yeah, the, it was, it's very, very rhythmic and I really liked, um, working on it, reading it is very agreeable. Mm. Um, it sounds very nice. Mm -hmm. Um, by far my favorite part, but actually a lot of the favorites part, I think we ended up having, or like that I have is not necessarily something from the poem itself, but it's reading the poem and kind of us thinking about our relationship to the poem mm. and 
there was there's this um, stanza that is essentially saying, you know, um, since I cannot be with you, um, I do not know where to go pray to you. Mm-hmm. And with, with, I think you, you mentioned that this was a bit our situation and we're trying to build something, um, some kind of a place or a, a, a set of work so we can go and pray in our way to Boston and, and if you go. So that, that's really what stuck with me. Yeah, I love that too. Um, and that's some of the joy of translating it with Antoine is having these shared moments. So the line is, and since, O oh, Lyric Apollo, I know not where to go to pray and say to you that I am your disciple. Um, and again, it's much more beautiful in French, but he and I felt like that's exactly the situation we're in. We don't know where to go and pray to Rust and say, I am your, I'm your disciple of romanticism. So creating this uh, translation was the best we could do. Um, so a little more, uh, my favorite lines there. So when he's thinking about why it will be better to be celebrating alone um, in Ernani, he says, there no heedless voice discoursing on the poet will come disturb my thoughts. The wind alone shall speak. Oh, I will not have the pomp of an official procession, but only the fading hillside and the stars brightening the sky. There, a little French breeze on this February evening will rustle through the juniper and blow among the larch. A pilgrim intoxicated with the hope of being blessed. I long to be there when this breeze blows upon Ernani. So I just love the idea of him being able to, sitting alone, feeling the breeze, hearing the rustling of the juniper, to be celebrating something with such sacred significance to him in his own way. Because we can all do that anytime, anywhere. Um, Okay, the next section, there's a change of meter again. And uh, the basic idea in in section three is that he's reached Ernani and he has to stop as as he reaches the threshold because he has too much emotion to actually step foot into it. So he's completely overcome with emotion. And then there are things like he sees some passing mountaineer and he imagines it's Ernani from the the hero of Hugo's play. He kind of almost loses his mind for a minute and thinks that's him, that's Ernani. And then he says, uh, then he comes back to reality and realizes it's just some passing mountaineer. Um, And then I mentioned this scene in, in my lecture, but I just love it so much. He enters, crosses the threshold, uh, sees a guard walking back and forth and notices on his cap, it says VH. Well, he's come there to celebrate Victor Hugo. He thinks of this town as a town that does not appreciate um, the man who gave its name such significance. And then he sees VH on his hat embroidered in gold. And he says, what does this mean, VH? And the guard says pompously, uh, Via de Ernani. So it wasn't quite what he expected. Um, And then, oh, there's just this beautiful passage of him looking at the landscape, seeing the rock of Santa Barbara and picturing, you've all seen, I'm sure, the pictures of Victor Hugo standing on a cliff with his cloak flowing in the wind behind him. That's kind of what Rostand imagines when he looks at these rocks. And he says, it is a shame you did not come here when you were exiled, because this place belongs to you now. It's marked with your magical figure. It doesn't belong to Spain anymore. It doesn't belong to the king anymore. This place belongs to you. Um, so uh, yeah, that's that's the theme of section three. Antoine, favorites? Uh, I was going to continue on, on on that like last theme, like that is this idea that the, the poet takes possession of that which he makes his you know subject, and that, that's something that's we're now seeing is is very very recurrent in in Austin, This idea of taking ownership of ideas around or things around, you just kind of take take a subject, you know, make a poem or work out of it, and suddenly it's more yours than anyone who's perhaps lived there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that, that's one of the great recurring themes of this poem is this idea that you know <laughs> yeah the, the people living there the people who look at the city just don't see the same things and they 
in Austin's eyes, they're just are seeing a lesser version of the city. They're, they are not living as they should because they should be in this whole drama invented by Hugo. Mm. And I just really love this. Yeah, that he always goes back to this idea that the Victor Hugo, either by just a single glance or by writing a poem, just has taken that space from the king. Uh, is enemy is now his, and it's uh, everyone. Everyone else is wrong to think otherwise. Mm. Um, that's a great uh, example of the idea of the man who finds meaning in everything. So when he's looking at across these scenes in Ernani Rostand, because of Hugo, is seeing something that its inhabitants can't. Um, so that's what Hugo allows us to do. And Rostand too. And then there's this wonderful transition at the end of that section where he says, um, it's the lines I just mentioned, but he says, this haughty village will always be yours. It is no longer Spain's, no longer its king's. By laying upon it the claw of a poem, you took this village from Don Carlos himself. But what am I saying? You did not wait so long. Child, you claimed it in passing with a glance. So that Ernani, which your work made yours, is more within Hugo than within Navarra. So he made it his by writing the play Ernani, but he made it his even before that. When he was a child, passing through, he glanced at it. It took on the significance for him that would later grow into the play. And in that moment, it became his. Um, so then the next section is him going back and imagining that experience of Hugo as a, I think, eight-year-old child traveling through Arunani and seeing it and having this become something that would settle in his soul and emerge as the play Arunani. Um, so section four is, uh, as I mentioned, Hugo first encountered Arunani when he was traveling with his mother and brother um, through the mother and brothers through Spain to, to um, see Hugo's father. And in this section, he's dreaming the details of Hugo's voyage. So that's a, a phrase that is kind of a refrain. I dream the details of the voyage. And it's again that Rostand Hugo capacity to picture the cart that they traveled in and describe it in rhapsodic terms, this like rickety patched up cart that his mother is appalled to have to travel in, but for the for the young children is just a thrilling place of play. And um, he, he makes ordinary things beautiful because of their significance. Um, and there's, an amazing section here. Well, two other important things about this section. This is where, if you saw my lecture, uh, he describes their travels and they pass the Chateau d'Ertubi, um, which is the chateau that I passed as I was traveling back from Irnani and stopped into and um, told them, oh, I was brought here because it was mentioned in a Ross Stan poem. And the this chateau has been in the possession of the same family since the 1400s. And the current owner had no idea that their chateau was mentioned in a raw stand poem. So I got to be the one to introduce them to this fact, which was very thrilling. So that part is in this section. And then there's another wonderful extended section about how as they were traveling across Spain, this um, uh, the, the Hugo's cart joined the convoy of the treasury. So because they were traveling with the treasury, they were they were uh, um, protected by a legion of guards. And Rostand is just commenting on the irony that these guards thought they were protecting a coffer of coins, when in fact, what they were really protecting is a boy whose soul was full of stars. <laughs> that was the true treasure that again, just like those people of Arunani were unaware of the significance, the guards had no awareness of the significance of what they were really protecting. Um, Antoine? Yeah, um, I think I had two two things that really I remember in particular from this. 
I think one of them was kind of when they leave um, one of the uh, cities and they there's the sound of horses and everything starts moving forwards again. And th there was this image of a quadruple omega, Can which you, we got very, very confused by. Were you just blunt? Wait, do you have those lines? Um, I'd love you to it, just bluntly yeah. translate. Um, yeah, um, it's the what seventh? I think it's, it's that right, right after the second. I dream the details of the voyage. Yeah, um, and there's um, so there's two sounds, uh, two sounds of yeah, they're starting like four sounds. So click clack, and already the um, the irons of the first mule um, have hit of a sonorous and quadruple omega the route of Oyazan and Astikaga. Mm -hmm. So as Antoine and I, so he would just go through it and kind of translate it literally. And so the literal translation is a, of it is the first mule, the irons of the first mule are, have already hit with their sonorous and sonorous and quadruple omega. They have hit it with their sonorous and quadruple omega. And there have been many times in this poem that I just thought, okay, I have no idea. I am completely lost. This is impossible. There's no way I'm going to translate into that into something intelligible or beautiful, but I don't even know what he's talking about. Now, once we figured it out, it seems so obvious that maybe we were just being stupid and it's obvious to all of you. I don't know, but the idea of a mule hitting something with its quadruple omega, we realized a horseshoe is just shaped like the letter omega. So he's just saying it was like hitting the road with the um, omega shaped horseshoes. Um, and it worked for his rhyme. He rhymed that with Astigaraga. <laughs> um, so in any case, we finally figured it out, but that was one that had us stumped for for a good moment there. Yeah, that, that, that was really fun. Uh, <laughs> and it, it, it's, it's one of those images which when we do end up understanding them, that suddenly they're not that difficult to translate because you can translate them literally because yes. the image still stands. Yes. Um, but yeah, I think that's one of the, I guess I can, I can say it here, that's like one of, one of the most valuable things I got from uh, working through this with you is that sometimes I get a bit lazy reading poetry and I just don't try to understand every little bit. Mm. And so I read it and go, well, I'll, I'll it's fine. I'll, I'll give him that. I'll, I won't, look too much into it and some stuff doesn't make complete sense and I, I just assume it's just pretty um poetic license and you were always there to to catch me on that and really push for a real proper meaning a proper integration with the rest of the the, the verses or the, the entire poem and that mm -hmm. was very valuable because a number of times we could have stopped and just decided to translate it truly but I think just diving for meaning every time was extremely valuable and it's, it's a great way to read poetry yeah i agree the, um, mm -hmm. i have one one more thing about this section which is um on the second stanza mm -hmm. um something which really confused me but again because i was reading it um in french at some point um and it's talking about uh, hugo's father who was a general and and who decides to bring them to madrid because um they've you know he's He's, he's now um, a bit softer. He's softened up after all the battles and he wants his children to have fun. Mm -hmm. um, and it goes like this in French. And I'm going to pronounce it like I would pronounce it in modern French. Le, gener le général Joseph Léopold Sigibert, dont le père est un humble artisan de province, veut voir jouer ses fils dans le palais d'un prince. Et qu'entre deux combats, ce héros s'attendrit se trouvait brusquement en route pour Madrid. And so the, well, this is um, 12 syllables on every verse, but also obviously rhyming. Um, this is the classic French Alexandrian. Um, the two rhyming verses at the end, et contre deux combats, ce héros s'attendrit, se trouver brusquement en route pour Madrid, actually don't rhyme if you pronounce them in modern French, because uh, s'attendrit, the T is silent, it just ends with E. And Madrid is pronounced as in English with the D, Madrid. And I was very confused about this. Hmm. Um, I ended up having my own theory about 
how it was translated. And then I think uh, we ended up asking um, uh, an academic in Guernsey about it. Uh, but basically, the way Madrid is pronounced in Spanish is with a much softer end. It's Madrid, Madrid. So you can actually make it rhyme if you say entre deux combats, deux combats, deux héros, André, se trouver brusquement en route pour Madrid. As more, then it becomes much nicer to the air, and it actually sounds like it rhymes. Mm. And I think the the thing that um, our friend in Guernsey said was that maybe. The T was not as silent for Satandri in French at the time. So mm -hmm. it was Satandrit and then Madrid. And then there we have this kind of soft T at the end after the I for both of them. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that, I always like those little details of that are between poetic license and the, the poet also just playing around with words because it, it might be that at the time Madrid was pronounced Madrid and that he just played around with the the Spanish pronunciation to add a bit of like a, a reference in there or, or make it sound more local. Yeah, I think there are other times too that he will alternately either use it, rely on the Spanish translation, so on the Spanish pronunciation for the rhyme, or change it to the French pronunciation to yeah. suit his purposes. Yeah. Um, but that shows the level of depth that we had to get into to do this. Okay, uh, three more sections. Section five, um, uh, he's still dreaming the details of the voyage. The boy Hugo reaches Ernani and Rostan thrills over what he imagines, at, over imagining what Hugo saw there, settling in his soul and becoming the seed from which the play Ernani would grow. And so he just, in this section, has a long series of colorful descriptions of the exotic sites that Hugo saw in Spain, um, and then closes with the idea that he is standing on the spot where Spain met Victor Hugo, and that's what's so significant about it to him. Um, so the images of Spain are just fantastic. Um, I think the line we had the most difficulty with, which I actually ended up posting on Facebook. And it's interesting. This is where translation, my translation projects met chat GPT. I had a real difficulty with one of the lines and someone said, well, why don't you ask chat GPT? And this was the first time anyone had suggested such a thing to me. So I was indignant at the suggestion because chat GPT was my enemy as an educator. Um, I've since used for translation purposes. It is a phenomenal tool. Um, it doesn't replace Antoine, but it, it, it's a good assist, good cheap assistant for him. Um, but in any case, they, someone suggested this. They fed this line to ChatGPT, and ChatGPT, to my uh, dismay, was extraordinarily helpful. So he has this series of descriptions of laughing mule drivers wearing sandals, barefooted girls with quivering toes, dark priests blending the shade of their cassocks with the pale, pale, peeled, tr pale peeled trunks of the plane trees, mules pulling um, carts with arched canvases. Okay, long series. And then it says at the end, um, seeing all this, Hugo became more Spanish than all of Spain herself. And then the last line, uh, Antoine, will you translate it literally? Isn't it basically that he was sunburned? It is finished. Um, yeah, he, he he received the sunburn. It is finished. He received a sunburn. It is finished. I was like, what on earth is that? <laughs> um, and I don't remember if this was the exact translation suggested by chat GPT or if I modified it, but I liked it. Um, it's a, it's a, taking poetic license, but I translated it as he felt the kiss of the sun. It was done. Like as soon as he stood underneath the Spanish sun and saw all these sights, it was done. Ernani had this significance for him and it was his. Um, I think there are other ways you could translate it, but I got like, he had a sunburn. That was it. I mean, <laughs> that didn't make sense to me, but the idea of, okay, standing under the Spanish sun, it was done. This was a part of his soul. Um, uh, Antoine, did you have any favorites from this section? 
I mean, it was actually that line, um, kind of going back to um, this idea that the, the poet just takes ownership mm -hmm. um, of the place and makes it greater than the place itself. Mm -hmm. um, like the, the fact that, yeah, he sees all of this in Spain, takes it in and becomes more Spanish than all the Spains, all of the well, Spanish in Spain itself. Mm -hmm. That he somehow condenses this or like really brings it down to what makes something Spanish. And he, he becomes that more than anyone or anything. Uh, mm -hmm. I really like that, yeah, the returning to that idea. And I think that section closes with an ultimate Rostand compliment because he has this scene at the very end where he says, um, so they're still traveling across the war-torn countryside. And his mother says, she tells her son, tuck your head in a bit, but a window shatters. A shot has been fired. How kind, the enemy sends me a ball, says the child. For this brave one with girlish hair already belongs so well to this land that he has added panache to his little cap. <laughs> so the little Hugo has panache because he's uh, unafraid of laughs in the face of the dangers around him. Um, all right, section six. Um, Rustand is ruminating on this child, this eight-year-old boy who's talking to himself in the corner of a carriage, but will someday forge his century. So right now he's just... Uh, you know, play, like delighted to have little objects in his pockets. That's enough to make him happy or to play with the rings on the curtains in the carriage. But someday he's going to forge his century. And Rostan takes that time to remind us, we cannot know when a god is passing. Um, so he is, that's that same image, Antoine, that you're talking about. Like Rostand is seeing in this moment of a child playing with the curtain rings, What's actually happened is that a god, a god is passing. And then um, my favorite part, which I mentioned in my lecture, but I've now translated with a little more attention, um, is just the images here of um, Hugo and his mother and just lines of tribute to mothers. And it says, mothers, not, not tribute to mothers, but reminding mothers to see the potential greatness in their children. Mothers, let respect sometimes tinge the tenderness of the kiss you place on your little dreamer's head. Let your lips sometimes, as they part the curls, be afraid of burning themselves on some sparks. Tremble in the midst of a laugh. Be frightened to hold the future thus on your knees. And remind yourself with a troubled thrill that when you take hold of a little head to gaze in the depth of innocent eyes, you might be holding a whole world in your hands. Oh, so beautiful. Um, and then there's a scene in this section where his mother cradling him on her lap like that just points and whispers in his ear, you see, it is Ernani. Um, so that's, that's the moment that he saw the city. Did you have a favorite there, Antoine? I think I'm, I, I was rereading it for for our purpose today, and I think going through the Musardis now, I'm reading it with a new eye. Mm. And there is this line uh, in the first stanza. Um, I mean, it's a, a small portion about him being the father over all of the poets of the century. Yeah. And the before last verse is what it is him, the eternal among the ephemeral. Yeah. And I, I think in the particular verse, it's, it's referencing more the people around him at a time, but there's this idea that's very rec recurrent in Ostan that um, all those poets can spring up from a romantic fervor and some of them become eternal and some of them stay in the dark. Um, and he, he's got all of that in that one verse, uh, finishing with, you know, Hugo was the one who, to manage to rise to the light and became the that eternal figure. And I, I really love the the ease with which that verse comes. Funny enough, it's it, it's not it's not some kind of final epic, you know, build up um like build up ending type of verse. There's been a lot of those and a lot of those in this poem where he, where he makes those lists as you say and then 
ends up with like one big statement. Here, even though it ends up with an exclamation mark, it gets, it's impossible to read it, read it loud and read it in an mm. epic fashion. Mm. It just feels like it's a, a matter of fact statement that is just so amazing to just say. So I, I really, really like uh, that particular verse and what's around it. I love that. Um, yeah, there's even that, I think we had a little bit of difficulty, but pretty quickly figured out there is a line that says, um, he's the one who will someday forge his century and who will practice the art of the ancestor capitalized. Well, if some of you may know that um, Hugo wrote a book called The Art of Being a Grandfather. So he doesn't say grandfather in the poem. He says ancestor because it suits his rhyme, I think. Um, but so uh, who will practice the art of the ancestor so well that pale apprentices at his forges, you know, future poets, will, um, will be, future poets will be his countless Georges. Well, George was the name of one of his grandchildren. So um, the future poets are just the grandchildren of the great Hugo, who is the one eternal among the ephemerals. Um, okay, and the last section, um, he's done dreaming the details of Hugo's voyage and he's back in Ernani himself. And he arrives at a humble little church that will have to serve as his place of worship for Hugo since he cannot be at Notre Dame, he says. Um, and then, so he goes and he describes going into this church, this humble little Ernani church, which we tried to discover an actual church that it could be, but I don't think we succeeded. Um, and then he comes out walking, walks out under the always beautiful sky um, and calls on Hugo I'm just going to read these lines because they're so good. Um, he basically says his own prayer to Hugo. He says, I emerge deeply moved beneath a beautiful sky, and I walk saying, Master, genius, Hugo, smile, father of a century, on your humble sons of an hour. Let this day's legacy live on in us. Give us the courage and give us the faith that we need to dare to work after that we need to dare to work after you um make sure that we rise at night to work that the laurel no longer allows us rest and take for a moment your hand from your temple to bless our forehead our heart and our sacred lamp persuade us well that work is all that we are nothing a song ascended of voices in chorus and tell us to sing so that all will understand. Um, so that's beautiful in its own terms, but this is another point I think that Antoine and I felt like he was speaking to us. Um, tell us to sing so that all will understand. Make these words available to, to all and um, keep working on it even when it feels like you won't uh, give us the courage and give us the faith because there are many times I felt unworthy of the task, but knew I just had to keep doing my best. Um, Antoine, did you have something from this? Yeah, that, actually, it was the same theme as for the last um, section. Uh, in in that same stanza, you was you were quoting this: uh, "Give us the courage and give us the faith to dare work after you." Mm -hmm. Like the, this existential dread that poets, romantic poets, get of knowing that there was Hugo before and trying to find something that's, you know, that has to be has to equal or be greater than uh, the man himself, mm -hmm. and this kind of dread being there is is really fun and it's it it really gives you an idea of what it was at the time and really kind of what he represented um, that century. If the, if the rest of the poem hadn't convinced you yet, like th this is what he was to those poets, uh, mm -hmm. just an absolute giant. And however much you know, they, they might like his works, that it, it adds some level of just uncertainty about, uncertainty about themselves because they don't know if they'll ever be able to match what he's produced. Um, I think it's probably a feeling that a lot of artists do get when they have some such a strong idol like this, perhaps even that, you know, that that close in history. Uh, that's much have been terrifying. Mm -hmm. um, and then 
funny again in the light of the the Musardis, um, just a few lines lower. Um, so bless for context. Yeah. Les, Mus Les Musardis is his first collection of poems. Um, Rostand's first collection of poems, and Antoine and I are, are working on that one now. Um, and it starts with a a long series of reflections of you can tell it is Rostand himself alone in this apartment in Paris. And there's a poem about his lamp and a poem about the dust mites in the rays, sun rays from the window. And a, actually two poems about his lamp, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so just he's contemplating all these simple objects in his room, but really ruminating about the um, kind of challenges of being a poet in Paris. So it is this theme, but sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's what I was going to mention, because the it, it ends with bless our foreheads, our heart, our lamp. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it does seem now that we're going through the Mizardi that this is, I mean, obviously, this this is this would be a common theme for poets in general, because they would be working with their table and their lamp. But it, it, this this is uh, a fun parallel. But yeah, this is what the, the poets need. They need their mind, their hearts, and the lamp that make, that allows them to keep going at night because that's that's what they do they have they have to be sat there and just produce something great mm -hmm. um so i'll just close with the fi final lines of the poem um so as he's walking through ernani he's stopped by a man um he says as i passed below the last wrought iron balcony a man in a gruff and arrogant voice said to me senor here, on this old street, Urbuda was born, the brave man to whom King Francis yielded his sword. And me, I said, born here on this ancient street was the play to which even Le Cid might surrender his. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Um, so that is the project. Um, any questions before we wrap things up here how do we get the handbound book <laughs> uh, <laughs> um let's see uh i think i can give you the link right now but i will definitely send an email um following this session i'll send an email to the whole group with a link to the handbound book um and so what i'm going to make but available is oh did you do it joseph oh okay there it is um what i'm going to make available is the handbound books the and then if you purchase a handbound book you'll get access to the english translate my english translation in the read with me app and um Antoine's reading of it in French in the Read With Me app, but I haven't quite finished that part yet. Um, any other questions? Luke? Uh, excited to to read the translation. Um, question about, did you, what did you find of for the, the history of the publication? Um, who was it written for? Or, um... Oh, it, that's a good question. So it was, it was um, requested by the editor of the newspaper, Le Galois. Um, but all I found was the book version of it. So I haven't actually looked into how it appeared, whether or how it appeared in that newspaper. That would be, that's something to find out. Anything else? Okay, well, thanks for indulging us. This is been one of the greatest joys in my life to work on and produce this. So uh, I'm really excited. I mean, just some ambitions that I have for it um, once I get the Amazon version produced, which I'm going to try to have. I'm going to try to give it a cover like this in the Amazon version. Um, I would love to see it in Arnaga, Ross Dan's home that I visited. Um, I'd love to see it on the shelves there. I'd love for uh, to go with Antoine there and do a presentation on this poem. That's one of my dreams. Um, so we'll see where we can carry this and get both Frostand and Hugo 
more in people's minds. Thanks for being here, Antoine. Sorry about the confusion. No Thank worries. you, Lisa it's and Antoine. Entirely on me. I, I wish I had to admit. It's no problem. Okay, thanks, everybody. Have a good day. Bye, everybody. Bye.